Some of you don't know a whole lot about pollen, except you know the effects of pollen. And so what we're going to talk about is what is it and how does it affect us. Well, why study pollen grains anyway? There are people who actually enjoy it. Uh, and the study is phenology, and these are people who like to study pollen. It's very detailed. Uh, it's very small, and I'll show you some pictures. Also, the uh, pollen tells us about the condition and identification, gives us a clue to life, both that lived prehistorically, uh, when you make a dig in a prehistoric uh, site, you can take the pollen, or you can take the soil, extract the pollen, and you can find out what was growing there, what the people used, how much corn was there, what were the wildflowers plants that they used. So you can find a lot of what they did before, and even now, people are studying pollen for, for a lot of reasons. Also, you use it a lot for specific plant identification, and that's tough. There are not many people, except these people, who really know how to do that. And we learn about a lot about ancient people uh, using pollen. And there are, like I said, are people who sift it out and look at it and are able to identify what plants were there. In New Mexico, we found a lot of pollen uh, from many of the ruins that were uh, uh, discovered in New Mexico. Salmon ruins. Now you know where salmon ruins is up by Bloomfield at Bloomfield? Uh, it had 31 different taxa found in a study of human coprolites. That's another fun thing uh, to do is to take coprolites, which are excrement from humans, and to cut it into little pieces and, and uh, look at it and see what's in it. Uh, and there's pollen grains in it. And if there's pollen grains, you know what went down those people's mouths because the coprolite is a foolproof. Uh, this was done with the, in the, in the uh, Pueblo III period. Well, these are the, where they found most of the pollen grains. What were they that they found at salmon? Uh, oops, excuse me. Rocky Mountain bee plant is one. Uh, they evidently ate it. Uh, it was there. You know, when I talk about uh, in the botanical garden about ethnobotanics, we have an ethnobotanical section. We have two sections there. One is the orchard garden, and the other, which mainly has plants that came from, from uh, nurseries and will live where we are. But in the ethnobotanical garden, we have plants that were used by the people. What do you think most of the plants were used for that we grow and that are found in northern New Mexico? Anybody? Not a lot for food, that's the thing. Pinon medicine. Pinon is a big deal because that had a lot. Also, also the gamble oak. Did you know the gamble oak you can eat right off the tree because it has so little tannin in it? All of the other oaks you have to wash them uh, to get the tannin out before you can eat them. Uh, juniper berries. How many of you have tasted juniper berries? Not very good. You wouldn't want to live on this stuff. Uh, and, then, and so during part of the year, there's nothing for them to eat. So what did they eat? Mainly corn, beans, squash. They grew it themselves. By the way, do you know where chili came from? You know that beans and squash and uh, corn came from where? From Mexico, from the Valley of Mexico with, with the Teosinte and then the ZMAs came up, but not chiles. Chile is the number one plant here. Did you know it didn't come up? No. Who brought it? The Spanish. The Spanish, Oñate. Oh. Oñate brought it because 
He, they found it in the Aztecs. The Aztecs used it a lot. And when the Spanish conquered the Aztecs, they took the chili seeds to Spain, went from there all over Europe and to the Orient, and then came back here with the Spanish. So that's kind of an interesting aside that we think that it came up just like all the other three plants did, but it didn't. It was brought by the Spanish, and it, it's wild in Bolivia, and that's where it came from. Okay, I, I've got grass sometimes. Uh, grasses, uh, they found a lot of grasses. Grass seed, even though it's pretty small, if you get enough of it, you can make a meal out of it, and you can make uh, tortillas. Uh, Chinopods, gooseblood. Chinopods are not something that I like a lot because they're the ones, one of them that makes me sneeze a lot, are chinopods. And then maize or corn, zea maize. So this is what they found mostly at salmon ruins. So you can see uh, living on things like that, plus the pinon nuts. I mean, everybody likes pinon nuts. Uh, evidence for the appearance of the first land plants happened about 450 million years ago. And these are the kind of, they were just spores. They were not, they were not pollen <coughs> grains. They were spores. So that means that they came from fern-like, cycad-like uh, plants, not flowers. There were no flowers. Can you imagine a world with no flowers? Well, there was one. <laughs> and that world was 450 million years ago. And that's where it was on the geologic time chart. This kind of gives you an idea of where this Artivician time is. It's way down here. Here we are, way up here. So there's a lot of time, a lot of things happened in Earth between then and now. <coughs> Here's a pretty good little graphic. Shows you about the difference between the <coughs> gymnosperms, which are the ones that have spores, and the, uh, no, not the spores, the, the cycads, the ginkgos, uh, the conifers, have, these have flowers, seed plants, flowering plants, these are seed plants. Gymnosperms, we'll talk about in a minute, those are the, the pines and the uh, 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 non-flowering plants. And then these that came up from the, the seed plants and then the two types of seeds, what the gymnosperms, the pine, and flowering plants. <clears throat> Angiosperms, which are the flowering plants, are distinguished from gymnosperms because they have flowers. <laughs> and a flower is a pretty unique uh, object because uh, it's very different from what the pine trees have, and uh, uh, they don't have the endosperm or the food that's in the seed, and then the fruit that contains the seed. And of course, the fruit. Uh, we know about because we, we uh, just collected it. The apples had just finished, and the cherries and all the peaches and things. Pinon pine and one seeded juniper are the two gymnosperms that we have in El Dorado. And it's a grass and those two plants, and that's it, pretty much. The, the pinon pine and one seeded juniper many times will grow together because the seed from the pinon pine doesn't like to germinate out in the open, but if it gets underneath a one-seeded juniper, it gets enough moisture and uh, not direct sunlight, and it will germinate and will uh, grow next to it. So next time you're in a juniper pinon forest, look for those two plants together, because you'll see it a lot, and that's why. Well, then as we come up the geologic time schedule here, you see that we get to the age of reptiles, which is around the Triassic and Jurassic time. So it's a lot farther up than we were before at the Ordovician. Now we're up here. Around 100 million years ago, flowering plants became widespread. And about 60 million years ago, they replaced the conifers as the dominant trees and plants. So there was a replacement uh, of the angiosperms, or the flowering plants, from the conifers. Water lilies are ancient. 
They go back 140 million years. So it's an ancient flower. Uh, you don't necessarily, when you look at flowers, you can't necessarily tell which ones are the oldest or the youngest, but now you know that the water lily is one of the very oldest. And here is where it, it's, it's right here at the Cretaceous. So it's pretty old as far as plants are concerned. <clears throat> a flower of a plant is a modified stem. And it has structures that are very modified from the leaves, the, the uh, petals, of course, and then the reproductive part here with the stigma and the style and the ovary, the part of the, the pistil. And then it has ovules inside. And here, the anthers uh, with, the, uh, uh, with the stamen uh, and the anthers on top. And so this is a complete flower. All flowers are not complete. But this is complete. It has everything. When the ovary is fertilized by the pollen, the surrounding tissue becomes the fruit. And there's all kinds of fruit. We had an excellent fruit year this year uh, because we didn't have a late freeze. Uh, and then we had a lot of rain. So we had two things that we really need to make a lot of fruit. And uh, at our house, we had uh, sweet cherries, sour cherries, apricots, which about every six years produce. We had tons of them. Peaches, we had more than we've ever had. And now the apples, the apples are the last. We also had plums. And so everything fruited this year. It was a really good year. Contrary to popular belief, that's a fruit. It's a tomato. Uh, it's uh, very different from all of these. You don't think of it like an apple or like a pear or like a peach, but it's uh, a fruit. Uh, these are pistols. I took these pictures with my camera. I have a camera and I'll show you a little bit about that later. But these are some pistols. Uh, I think these were like chamisa. Uh, the chamisa is finally blooming. It's the last thing to bloom. I raised bees, honeybees, for six years. I haven't raised them in three years. The reason is that raising honeybees where I live is a task because you don't have a lot of flowers as long as you need them. Did you know that the honeybees in Texas are almost all Africanized. We were there, I'm a Texan. You might tell from where I'm talking. Uh, <clears throat> they're almost all Africanized. But as far as from Santa Fe and maybe Albuquerque, but I know Santa Fe up, you won't have African bees unless they're brought here by someone who buys some from Texas and brings them here. They won't last through the winter because they, Africanized bees, have to be able <clears throat> to forage all year. Because after all, where they come from, they can forage all year. If you get farther, farther south, there are plants that they can find all year. And so they can live there. Texas is wonderful for Africanized bees. And the African males, are, the drones, are a lot more active and successful than the Italians. <laughs> you would think the Italians would be pretty good at finding the queens. But the Africans are much better. So what happens is that you get a lot more Africanized hives, but not up in the north, not up here, not in Santa Fe. <clears throat> uh, Chamisa is the last thing that blooms, and it's the last thing that the honeybees can bring into their hive. The next thing that comes, you know what it is? You make a guess. No, uh, not juniper. Uh, well, they don't like juniper much because it doesn't have any. Doesn't have any. Any. They'll eat. You know, they'll go to the elms and they'll get some pollen. But the next thing that has nectar for food, what do you think it is? Fruit trees. So they have to wait for fruit trees. So you have to have enough food in the hive for them to last, or you have to feed them, and it's not easy. Uh, raising bees is not, it's fun, but it's not easy. 
Uh, here's some anther pictures. Uh, these I took as well. Uh, you can see these are the anthers. Here's a little pollen grains. These were at 140. Uh, that's as far as I go for the pollen grains. I don't know what the uh, magnification is on this exactly for these, but uh, I know to get down to see the pollen grain, and I'll show you some pictures that I took, my 140X gets only so far. You need an electron microscope to do some of them. Well, pollen grain consists of different parts. Uh, it has a central a cytoplasmic part and a nu nucleus, and it has a wall. And the wall has two parts to it. And the outer part is very, very resistant to environmental, uh, anything environmental. Heat, cold, water, it's very resistant to it. That's why you find pollen grains thousands of years old in these ruins of the Pueblo, is that this, this uh, outer, whoops, this uh, outer wall, the exon, is very, very hard. It's made of cellulose, it's very hard, and it has to have certain conditions uh, to break it down anyway. And so you find a lot of them uh, in the uh, Pueblos <clears throat> because of this hard uh, outer layer. And here's what a pollen grain looks like according to someone who draws pollen grains. <laughs> it has a wall around it, it has a cytoplasm inside of it, and it has these nuclei, this one is a tube nuclei, because when the pollen gets on the stamen, it has to grow a tube to get down to where the egg will be to fertilize it. So it has to have two of these nuclei, the two nuclei, and then it will have the generative cell nuclei, which has two sperm, which is kind of weird. Uh, plants are different from us. And so when you think of what they have and how it's used, it's similar, but it's different. Well, it, it, there's something called double fertilization, because like I said, there's two sperm in there. One is to fertilize the egg, and the other is the polar nuclei in the embryo sac. And I'll show you a picture of that. This is another artist drawing. It's not true. But anyway, the pollen grain falls on the stigma, which is on top of this style here, and it starts to grow. And it grows down a pollen tube, and then it grows up through uh, the to, up to the bottom to the polar nuclei, and it fertilizes it, the egg in there. Here's another uh, how it grows through the uh, grows down around and through this micropile and grows up into it, fertilizes it, and then the two sperm nuclei uh, go into the two, two different parts, and double fertilization occurs. So it's Biology. That's, if you're interested, that's good. If you're not, that's okay. <laughs> Size of pollen grain. How big are these things? Well, pollen grains can be, first of all, you have to know about a micron because a micron is a little bitty unit of measure and it's one twenty-five thousandths of an inch. A human hair, hair is about 70 to 100 microns. So think of that, 70 to 100 microns in diameter. The average size of an allergy producing, now there's, we're going to talk about two kinds of pollen. One's going to cause allergies and one's not. And one is because of, anybody know? Wind. The other one is not because it's heavy. And you have to have something moving it, like a bee. A bee. Uh, you have to have something moving it. Chamisa does not make you sneeze. That's not what's making you sneeze. The bees are on it, they're taking the pollen, but it doesn't blow in the wind. It's heavy. What's making you sneeze? What? The airborne. And what are they that are there? Do you know? We're going to talk about them. Uh, there are things that blow in the wind that you don't see unless they come in a big group. And sometimes that happens like with, sometimes with uh, uh, 
uh, pine pollen. You park your tree, you park your car under a pine tree, and you get all this yellow stuff. Well, the average size of an allergy producing one is 25 microns. Remember, a human hair, 70 to 100. This is smaller than that, 25 microns. Some can be as small as 2.5 microns. That's really little. Or as large as 200 microns. Well, if you don't know what a micron, if you can't visualize it, but that's a big difference in size. And these yellow flowering ice plants are 17 microns, and the purple crocus, crocus are 139 microns. Well, that just shows you that one's bigger than the others. All this is, is telling you. Well, here's some pollen. Some of these are my pictures. Uh, mine are not like that or that. Those are taken with an electron microscope. I don't, can't get that close down. These are mine. Here, 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 here. I took all those, and some of them are pretty neat. Look at that one. Uh, this one here it has little little ridges in it. This one here has got looks like it's got a little pocket in it. Uh, it's got little things around the edges. Could you imagine that in your nose? <laughs> Talk about sneeze. You know you don't see these things. I mean, there's a whole other world there. You're sneezing, and this little thing is doing something in your nose, and it's got little spines on it, and there might be a million of them, so you can see what's happening to your body. Uh, I took these photos of plants that were uh, around my house. Uh, this was a velvet weed. You familiar with velvet weed? It grows up. We have a lot of them in El Dorado. It grows up, has real soft leaves, and then has a long, uh, uh, like a flower stalk and little bitty bitty flowers on the top. Is that gaura? No. No, it's it's different. Uh, choya, tree choya. We have a lot of those. You you don't have as many as we have, I don't think. And uh, here, but look at it. it. Looks like a soccer ball. It's got little dents in it. Uh, these look like little cups. This is yellow crocus. That yellow crocus is our second flower that blooms in our garden. And then we have a hardy winter jasmine, and that blooms first in February. And look at the size here. Now, how in the world can I look at that and tell what it is? I couldn't, because you have to have uh, an electron microscope to see some of these. But if I see that, or if I see that, I know what plant it comes from. That's just an accumulation out of my beehive. Just a bunch of pollen grains all jumbled together. What are they? I have no idea. <laughs> they're elongated. They're elongated. So, since they're elongated, you can use this. And this is what pelenologists do. They've memorized all this. And how these things look. And what plants have them in the area. And they have files and files and files of notes showing all these different ones. But this is their classification category. They use these. So they find one and they first say, kind of like if you're looking at leaves, you know, is it palmate, is it pinnate, what, what is it first? They have to look at this and they say, oh, look at this. It's a, it looks like this, so it must be a zono plate, uh, a zacole plate, or whatever that is. I have not memorized those, uh, but some people do. Paleontologists, if you want to become one, you probably will take a test on that, like uh, in the lab. And if you fail it, you've got to take it again, because you've got to know all of these different ones. This came from uh, this particular uh, botany site. Pollination is the process where pollen is transferred for reproduction of plants. That's what it's really trying to do. When it gets in your nose, it's too bad. It didn't really want to be there. It wanted to be on a female. Did not want to be in your nose. That's gone. You're going to kill it. 
And, but there are so many millions of them around that really it doesn't really matter that you kill those two million. Uh, it occurs by either wind or animals, one or the other, generally. And there are, are names for plants that are pollinated by the wind. And this is anamorphally. People have never told me that. I've never heard that because I'm not a paleontologist and I didn't take a course in it. But almost all gymnosperms and many plants that are in grass, many grasses, sedges, and rushes um, are windborne. To be windborne, they have to be pretty small. And also, it causes this, and that's what you suffer from. It's polynosis. So next time you're sneezing, you say, oh, I have a bad case of polynosis. <laughs> because that's what you have. And they're usually the pollens that are dispersed by air currents. And they're very small, and they're very lightweight. So when you see the chemisa blooming, look down at the grass, because that's what's getting you. Not the chemisa that's all over it being yellow. The yellow ones don't bother you. It's those grasses. It's those chinopods. It's the sedges. It's the rushes. It's all those other plants uh, that uh, are giving you trouble. That gives you trouble. That's a juniper. That's a male. And as you drive around where the juniper in the juniper forest, you see these that are kind of rust color. Those are the guys. The girls never look like that. They're just they kind of green, and they make they make the juniper berries. But this is what you see, and if you hit it, it's a cloud. It's a cloud, just like that. It makes you sneeze. <laughs> That's the next thing that happens after winter. These, and watch as you go through and you see the junipers, because you'll notice the males, and there'll be here and there among all of these females. Well, we get a pollen, a pollen allergy forecast of what, what is it and how bad will it be? And this is, just happens to be one, uh, pollen.com, and it tells you each day, you can see a bar, uh, bar graph, and this tells you yesterday, today, what are they, juniper and elm. So you know the season that this was taken in. Not now, but it'll be the next one. It'll, what, when does it happen here? February. February starts. Yeah. And it's bad for the those of you that have juniper and elm, especially juniper allergies. It's as bad as this one with the chinopods and the grass. Well, pollen count is done by people who enjoy looking at pollen because it's painstaking. It's not an easy thing. It doesn't, machines don't do it. They collect it. I'll show you some of the machines that do it. It's expressed with pollen per cubic meter over 24 hours. That's the way they tell you, uh, the pollen count. Uh, if someone's really sensitive to pollen, 15 or 20 grams per cubic meter could make them miserable. And so it doesn't take much if you have a really bad allergy to a certain pollen. And they test it by accumulating it somehow and by putting it on a grid and then counting it. And that's a painstaking thing. Uh, it's done under optical microscope and they count how many are there. That's a job. Somebody may want to do that someday. <laughs> There's an association of people that get together and they talk about this stuff. This is the American Association of stratigraphic paleontologists and what they do it was in 1967 that 32 people got together I didn't know, 32 got together people who really like to do this and they made this organization and notice right in the middle of it there's a really nice pollen grain and that's their symbol well these are the machines that do it uh, I've never done it, so I've just copied these machines. This one here uh, is one where the air goes inside of a sampler, and then, it's, then the dust is separated out, 
and it's used in centrifugal force. Uh, somehow it gets the polygrains separated from everything else. Then there's a, another kind that's impaction that throws it down into the machine with this fan. And then there's another one that sucks it in. So there's three machines they use to count pollen. And I don't know which one's the best, the easiest, or the one that's most used. Well, there's some plants that are pollinated by insects. These are not big pollen grains. These are, I mean, these are not small. They're very big pollen grains. And usually, the insects pollinate them inadvertently. It just happens. But there's some bees that collect them. And these bees are honeybees. Honeybees have special little pouches where they fill them up with pollen, and they go into the hive, and they empty them, and they go find some more. And they do that day in, day out. Honeybee workers live about six weeks before they get pretty torn up, and then they, that's it for them. But that's one of the jobs of one of these little honeybees. Well, inadvertently, they have hairs on them, and the hairs collect the pollen too. And so when the bees going around from one plant to another, they're moving pollen around. And an interesting thing about bees, honeybees, probably other bees, but I know honeybees. Honeybees will go out in a circle. They'll begin that way, and they'll find a flower that's blooming. And usually there's more than one. Usually there's a bunch. So she'll take the nectar, get the pollen, come back, and she'll do a dance and she'll do a wiggle dance. And the faster she wiggles, the more excited her sisters become. And then she'll tell them where it is in relation to the sun, how she is on the hive. And then she'll take off. If it's a really good source, several others will follow her. And when they get there, they'll be happy too, and they'll all be dancing in there. And then the whole hive, the ones that go out every day, will all go to that one source. They will go to the closest source they can find. Because remember, they go in a circle every day from the hive, and they find things. And then all of them go, or a lot of them go, <clears throat> and the ones that have the most nectar, or the most pollen, you have more bees on. If you ever wondered if you'll take a, a, a Coke can, uh, with a poor little Coke, I love Coca-Cola, sweet, and put it in a little jar, you'll get a bee. And then you'll get five bees. And then 10, 20, 30, and they'll, they'll keep coming until it's gone because they'll go to the closest source. They can go as far as six miles for honey, but what they'll generally do is stay close because they'll get to the closest ones. And there she is. She's found something that she's happy with. <laughs> this is also an interesting thing. This 47 million years ago, this little bird ate some pollen and then died. Here's the pollen right there in that little bird. Oh. So they know that where that was and what the bird was and that it was actually a pollen eater, and which is kind of cool uh, that they actually found this in uh, the fossil remains. Well, in New Mexico, we have several kinds of pollinators. And you'll see them all around. We have moths. And sphinx moss is our favorite because it looks like a, a hummingbird. And it'll come out usually in the evening or morning early. And it acts just like a hummingbird. This is, but the nasty thing is that if you grow tomatoes, the tomato hornworm is its caterpillar. So if you're growing tomatoes, you're going to find these big, huge tomato hornworms. But they turn into these really beautiful moths. Butterflies carry pollen. Beetles of all different kinds. Flies and hoverflies carry pollen. Hummingbirds. Uh, they love our Virginia creeper and our uh, gastiches. They love to get in there, each little flower, and take pollen. I mean, take, take nectar, but they get pollen on them, and they move it to the next plant. Some native bees actually 
do better pollinating than honeybees. Uh, this one here, for example, is the blue orchard basin bee, and there people will try to grow them, have them to come back, and the way that they do that, and what happens, uh, these bees will light tubes, and they will lay their eggs in the tube with a little bit of pollen and bee bread, and then they'll generally stick something in there in between and do it all the way up. Usually it's leaves. And this is a bee house. Uh, this is uh, to attract them. And then bumblebees. Uh, bumblebees are good for tomatoes uh, pollination. You ever looked at a tomato flower? It's all closed up. But the bumblebee gets on there and shakes it and sometimes gets into the flower. And when it does, the pollen falls down from the, from the anther into the pavement, I mean, into the uh, pistol. Carpenter bees, you don't want those in your house. Uh, this is an interesting one, leaf cutter bees. Uh, we, we have lilac. And I noticed on the lilac leaves, there were little things like serrations. I had no idea what that was. All of a sudden, these serrations would show up. Well, it's because of this little lady here. She's taking that, she's cutting the leaf and taking it into her tube, laying her egg on a little bit of bee bread, and then stuffing lilac leaves, and then doing it again and again and again until she's filled up a tube. Sweat bees. These are the first ones I see uh, that are just kind of in the early, early spring around my fruit trees. They're very small. They're like this, little, little bitty ones. Bee bread is what the bees eat, uh, and it's made up of pollen with honey and nectar, and this is the composition of it. It's 55% carbohydrates, 35% protein, minerals, vitamins, fatty acids, and other components. This is what the bee eats if they're not queens. If they're queens, they eat only one thing, royal jelly, which comes out of the bee's body and feeds them. Generally, they'll stop feeding royal jelly to workers, and they'll start feeding bee bread. And it's mainly pollen, is mainly what it is. The royal jelly throughout time will cause that female to become uh, able to, to mate and to lay eggs. The others won't. Bees don't see things like we do. This is the way bees see things. They have eyes that are, uh, have a lot of facets. This is what we see, that's what they see. So when you look at a flower and you see a yellow flower, they see this because they see an ultraviolet light. So all those yellow flowers, they're not yellow to bees. They are colored in some way and generally, they're different color on the outside of the flower than the inside of the flower. Here's another picture. Yellow flowers. How many yellow flowers do you have here? A lot. But they're not yellow to bees. They're seeing ultraviolet light. And they're seeing a different color than you. Well, honey that doesn't have pollen in it is not honey. Because once you take the pollen out, it's not true honey because true honey is supposed to have pollen in it. Does that make sense? I mean, why would honey not have pollen in it if a bee carried it? Well, what happens is that if it's ultra filtered, they can get the pollen out. China cannot sell honey in the United States. They use chemicals on their plants that's found in the honey and they're not supposed to sell it. Now, what happens if they sell it to Argentina, and Argentina puts it in another container and it says Argentina, and it comes here as Argentine honey. If it doesn't have any, if they ultra filter it, it has no pollen, so a paleontologist can't tell what trees it came from, because they know what trees grow in China. And they know what trees grow in every country of the world where they get honey. 
that's what they do. They're specialists. So, some of your sopapilla honey may not be honey. It may be something else. Well, what is it? Well, I'm going to tell you in a minute. Sometimes it's just ultra-filtered from China. Sometimes it's not even honey. Sometimes it's just uh, cane syrup with colored flavor. Uh, this is interesting. Einstein, I don't know if he really said this. He said if bees ever died out, mankind would be dead five years, four years later because we use plants for food, so many of them, that rely on honeybees. And some of them only on bee pollination. The almonds, for example. Honeybee raisers who take honeybees to California in February for two weeks get hundreds of dollars, thousands for these truckloads because the almonds need those honeybees. <coughs> what if all of them were gone? They couldn't move them. You wouldn't have any almonds. You have a few. There's a few here and there, but not many because you may have some natural pollinators. Well, if you didn't have bees, this is what you'd have for breakfast. Oatmeal and corn tortillas. <laughs> Oats or grass. Corn tortillas are corn, grass, and they're wind pollinated. So you would only have wind pollinated. This is what Dr. Ben, Dr. Von Bryan from Texas A&M found out. And this is interesting if you read through that. This was in Food Safety News. How many of the honeys that he sampled had no pollen in them? And this is what he found. Look at these 100% drugstores. Here, Smuckers, McDonald's, uh, KFC, all these little packages. They're not honey, mostly. They're, he found that they weren't, because he was given a grant to do this. Well, I did a pollen study when I raised bees, and I got a microscope, and I collected pollen, and I looked at it, I made slides, at which was, was kind of interesting. And I've tried to compare those pollen grains that I collected with the bees, what the bees brought in. I couldn't do it because some of you them know, were really small. And remember the chart that had all the different kinds? I would know if it was velvet weed. I'd know if it was choya because they're big and very different. But a lot of them are just very small. I couldn't tell. Anyway, but it was fun. Uh, I did that one year. Uh, you need all of these things to do it with. And this is how you do it. So it was an involved process. It wasn't one that you just do over the stove. And then I went to restaurants. And I had little packages. And I would steal a little honey, <laughs> and I would put it in my pocket, double, double bagged. <laughs> and I'd take it home, and this is all that I needed to do that. And I had to buy me a centrifuge. I had to buy a centrifuge from China. <laughs> and I used these test tubes with the little uh, ends on them. And here's my microscope. And do you know what I found? I went to like, oh, 15 different restaurants and sampled their honey to see if it was honey. I went to find out. You got something. I was going to go to them. You know, put it in the paper. You know, Tomasita's honey has no pollen or whatever. All of them had pollen. Good news. They all had pollen to some extent. Some you just find a little grain here or there. Some you find full. So I was happy about that that all these restaurants had pollen in their honey. I was really on to show them up, but I, it didn't work. <laughs> anyway, I post all these things on our website, El Dorado Wendy Farm, and on that I have, uh, this is like apples. You have an apple, and I have all the different things that have to do with apple. The apple, the pollen, 
This is electron microscope. This one I don't have, but this is the way I see it. So it's kind of hard. It's not that easy. And I want to thank you. Uh, this is our logo. It has bees. It has lavender. It has wind, which we have from about uh, three months in the spring of constant wind. It never stops like 40 to 60 miles an hour every day. And we have, uh, we have mountains. This is a backyard. This is the Eldo, El Dorado Windy Farm website, the Poland study. And you can see all of the different things, the plant listing, the wild plants. And when I went around, I uh, observed them and wrote them down. And uh, when I first observed them flowering, these are all the ones that are there. And then you can click on one. Here's a four o'clock. And you can go to the plant, see the plant and the pollen. So that's kind of an interesting thing. Uh, also, uh, also uh, at the botanical garden, Susan and I are uh, docents and have been docents there for five years. And one year, we did this study in 2013, and we went to the garden every week from October, no, from March through October, and recorded what was blooming. And so you can go to this website, and you can go to the orchard garden, you can look at it, and you can see the uh, location of where the plants are, and you can see uh, the blooming schedule of those plants and what color they were, and then you can go to a special plant and check the description, and if it has ethnobotanical use, you can go to that. And we also are uh, docents at Pecos National Historical Park, and we did a study there, same study, but a couple years later, and in this study, we went on the same schedule, once a week, for the same length of time, and determine what wild plants were there, and then something about the wild plant. So for example, here, uh, uh, the uh, calendar of blooming, the uh, native plants that bloom, they started when it began to bloom, when it ended blooming, and then if you go to the, say, the Indian paintbrush, it'll tell you where it was on the trail, the location, the way the plant looked, the distribution, the description, and the ethnobotanical use. So it's a pretty good site. It's fun to go through in the winter when you have nothing else to do. <laughs> go through it and have fun with it. And I uh, thank you very much. <laughs>
it's basically a, it's it's a food, a just a nutritional food, food supplement. Okay. It's expensive. Fine. Is it expensive? Um, it's like to get the quantity of pollen. That's like why. Oh, oh, you know how they get it? That's why I order online. Because yeah. Of the bees, so. Do you know? How, do you know how they get pollen? Mm -hmm. There are pollen extractors that are put on a uh, a hive, a Langstroth hive, the ones that square. Where the bee comes in through the gate, yeah. through the little door, yeah. they have a little extractor that squeezes her little pollen tube, little pollen out of her body, and dumps it into a little tray. And the people pull the tray out, and they take the pollen from that. And so that pollen has not gone to the bees; it's gone to the food source. But that's how they do it. So the site that I ordered from five pounds to forty-five dollars. How long is that last? Uh, considerable amount of time. I can't yes. What is the royal jelly? Royal jelly is a substance that comes out of the bee, out of the worker bee, and they take that from other bees. There are two things that come out of bees. One is the royal jelly, the other is wax. Wax is secreted in their abdomen, and I think the royal jelly comes out behind their head. And they take it and they feed it to the queen cells. And that makes them develop into a queen. If they don't get royal jelly their whole life, they turn into a worker. They're all, all the workers are female that didn't have royal jelly their whole life. I know that was being marketed. It was. Now, I don't know how to get that out. Yeah. <laughs> because that comes out of their bodies. Uh, the, oh. And the same thing with wax. They wax. Wax, I've seen how it comes out. It comes out in little, little, funny little round pieces, little, little um, discs that come out. And they take it and they chew it up and then they use it. The long chain alcohol. Long chain alcohol. <laughs> but they secrete it. Yes? Um, you've probably already done this, but with all the data you've been monitoring about bloom time uh -huh. and different species, are you connected to the National Phenology Network? No. Because you, you could just turn in or reference your website. And yeah, I, I could reference the website. Yeah. yeah and because I don't plan to do that again. <laughs> <laughs> it's awesome because that's all shifting all the time now. Okay? Yeah. And the more information they have like that, the better they're producing. Well, they're certainly welcome to take anything off of here that, that they like. I but they have to know about it. Yeah. So, so if that and another citizen science project, because that'll, that'll help. Determine where if you uh, my website my emails on there. Yeah. If you'll email me, tell me more about it. I'll look at it. Yeah, up. it's for, it's National Phenology okay, Network. Good. But send it to me because okay. I don't yeah. remember you everything your cards I hear. Are up here. Okay. Your cards with your oh yeah, my cards are up here. If you'd like to take one, okay. it has the website, has my email and everything. Then you can go in during the winter and look through it because it's extensive. Both of those web, both of those parts are very extensive. Uh, I did them during the winter. That's really sitting down at the computer collecting information. Any anybody else? Yeah, we mm -hmm. have uh, the um, uh, pinyons growing up right close to the one city juniper. I have a, that situation in our yard, and also I have them growing up in the middle of some sagebrush. Oh yeah, right. they would do that too because now, they get the same. Is that because they, it's because yeah. underneath there yeah. it's it's wetter yeah. and it doesn't have direct sunlight, I see. Yeah. and so they're able to germinate and grow right up through it. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I, I pull up their pollen.com to try to monitor what's going on. Mm -hmm. you know, the rates go way up and way down. Yes. Um, several times during the year, and right now they're quite low, but yes. I know a lot they're, of people who are having a lot of problems. Well, you saw one of the slides. Yeah. Some people are allergic to just a little bit, whereas other people it takes more. So it doesn't mean that it's not out there, it just means that your sensitivity is greater than other people to certain pollens. And what do bees do with the pollen? The bees make, the bees make bee bread. And there was, a, there was a slide. And bee bread is mixed, the pollen is mixed with nectar or honey. 
and it makes bee bread, and that's what they feed their larva. It's a food for larva. That's important for them. Very. So when it's robbed from them... Uh, if you robbed it all out, it would be a problem. Uh -huh. But I don't think you rob it all out. I think that they, right. they allow some to go in because it's food. It's also storage. If you've ever gone into a beehive, uh, I've done both um, Langstroth hives, which are the, the square ones, and the top bar hives, which you pull up has like 28 bars. If you go into there in the, about this time of year, you'll find that a lot of those cells are full of bee bread. But it's things that they're going to eat during the winter. Not only is it pure honey, but some of it is actually, it's not pure pollen either because they mixed it and it's bread. It's kind of into bees are another whole interesting thing. Yes? The old wives tale is that pollen is deactivated after a hard freeze. So do you, have you noticed that or is that just something that... Is an activator of what? It deactivates, it is deactivated by a hard freeze so that you don't have as much I, I think allergic reaction. I think what no, I think what happens is that the natural cycle of plants is to bloom with the pollen and then make seed. Mm -hmm. So I think what's happened is that it's gone from pollen to seed making and then freezing. So I think that's what's happened. Not not the deactivation of the pollen, but that the pollen has done its course, has pollinated, and has made seed, and then it goes through the winter. So I believe that's probably true. Right now, if you have enough freezes, uh, you're not going to have any pollen anyway, and because it's going to kill a lot of these plants, that they're going to shrivel up, and there'll just be seeds all over the place for next spring. The pollen's gone. But the pollen's still there in the ground. Remember uh, the Pueblos? Uh, they do the study, and there's pollen everywhere, but it's not in your nose. <laughs> it sounds like pollen uh, can just sit around for years and years and thousands, years and thousands of years. Yeah. And, and I wonder if it's still viable. I don't know. I I wonder know. How no idea. That would be. Do old? you know? Probably not. No. Okay. Okay. The cytoplasm would have to be viable. And that's the kind of juicy part. Okay. And the juice would probably have dried up. And probably the cell wall would still be there. And they can look at the cell wall because the cell wall would have its configuration, yeah. but the cytoplasm would be gone. It'd be gone. Yeah. So so I want so can pollen kind of be um, good and active for maybe like if it was sitting around uh, on the edge of a plant, you know, that's died and it goes in the, in the ground. But if it was brought up and sprinkled somehow... Know, what you need to do <laughs> <laughs> is to collect pollen from whatever kind of plant, put it, in, put it in some kind of little container, keep it out of the sun, do whatever you want, and then next year pollinate the, the plant with it, the flower, and see if it worked. And then you keep several years worth of it, and every year do that. That'll give you 10, 20 years worth of work to do. <laughs> and then you can write a, and then you can write a book. I'm going to run out of years. <laughs> Anything else? I did just look up pollen.com, and right now, uh, well, for ranch, I put in my zip code. It's like low, low to medium is the allergy. Ragweed, sagebrush, and the peanut pods. Yeah. And peanut pods are, well, what's that? Um, lambs quarters. Lamb quarters is one. Popular and food. if you see, you can tell what they are it's because their their flower stalks kind of look like little fingers on these things. You can't really see the flowers, but if you hit it, you really can. Uh, kosha. Kosha. Yeah. You know kosha? kosha. It is, oh, and it's 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 everywhere. It's at, at, in uh, Pecos National Historical Park, it grows on all the mounds. And they, they, they're afraid to pull it up because they're afraid the mounds will start to disintegrate. And so they'll cut it back, but they still can't control it. It's uncontrollable. Oh, it's a chinopod? It's a chinopod. Really? 
kosher. Yeah. Look at the little flowers. Now look at the little, the little flowers on Chilmah. I mean, on the kosher. It's really, it's a nasty thing. The, the control is a goat. <laughs> yeah. Goats love it. Yeah. yeah. I know people who use it as far as. Yes. Yeah. That's why it's probably here. Because it probably got a lot of our plants that we found <coughs> in Magos were not plants that were there when the natives were there early on. These were brought in by the Spanish, and a lot of them were on their animals, on their on their fur. A lot of them were carried on their on their um, uh, wheels, and so they're not native at all. They were just brought in, and they were used somehow as they became. Uh, naturalized. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.